Okay, I'll give you a bit of a brief outline of the course so you know what to expect. So, so part one will be 20 minutes of me talking about what a basic record is, just to get everyone familiar. I know some of this will be quite familiar to many of you, so there's, there's, don't worry if it's too simple. But I have been told on some of these courses, is it's always best to make them simple and then everybody's included then. But it will get more detailed later on. Ashton's also going to give you an overview of the state of bird records and how to submit them and some of the technicalities of using some of the Covenod systems. So a lot of these uh, areas that we're covering are, are common to all sorts of biological recording, not just birds, so it will be quite useful for that. And then part two is where Ian will take over the reins with his presentation and he'll be giving us 30 minutes of in-depth information about how to record birds and what exactly he's looking for. So I've seen his presentation already and it's quite interesting. There's lots of useful tips there that will help you get familiar with bird recording. And then there'll be 15 minutes or so questions towards Ian on aspects of bird recording. And it can be anything from equipment all the way through to what makes a good record. And then part three will be a roundup. That'll just be a close down really and maybe a bit of an open mic session for any other sort of recording type questions. Right. Okay. So what is a record? Well, that is a, an interesting question, isn't it really? Because yeah, I know when I first started working at Covnod, I'd, I'd say, tell my friends, oh, I've got a new job in a record centre. They thought I was selling vinyl CDs, vinyl records, so yeah, that sort of got out of the window. People are a bit more familiar with what a record centre is now. So a record, what we distill it down to are the four W's, so that's a good way of remembering it. So essentially four W's are what make, makes a good record. So you start off with a record, What it, what is it? Well. Basically, it's the name of the th thing you've seen. So either Robin or the scientific name there. So on our systems, you can generally enter them either using a common name or the scientific name. You can also put them at family level if you if if, if it's a species group that's tricky. But I think with birds, we're more comfortable using full species names. It's not like some of the more difficult taxa where you needing to rely on genus level things like parasitic hymenoptera or, or the and then of course there's where where have you seen it what these are the sort of core features of a record so it's the location so either a town name a nature reserve name one thing to avoid is obviously don't make it too parochial like my garden because really a record has got to be useful to somebody else who sees that record in the future. So if they've suddenly been confronted with a species list with a location saying my garden, it's fairly meaningless in the future. And remember these records could be looked at in 100, 200 years time. So make it something sensible for where you've seen it. And obviously the part of the where is a grid reference. I know Ian will go into more detail about that. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with grid references, so I won't talk about that. And then there's when. Uh, always useful to have a date of when you've seen this. And there's various levels and accuracies, I suppose, of what sort of date you want to give it. Probably best is to give it a, a, a day date. So I don't know, 2nd of September this year, or if you're you only, know the month say it was a, a moth trap or a pitfall survey where you'd left it out for a period of time you could put a date range or you could just put the month and the year you can even put it as a season so depending on what you're recording really and a year but obviously a year is useful but it's not as good as a, a day record because some of these species are seasonal they may only appear in spring and that's useful for a county recorder to verify a record because many species are seasonal and if for instance you're you're seeing a swallow in December 
you might start wondering what's going on there because really they should all have gone by then. So that's a useful sort of double check whether the record's good. So well worth putting a good quality date in there. And then who? So that's good so that you actually tag the record with your name. You can put them in various formats. So your full name or maybe just a contraction. And if you don't know who recorded it, put it as down as an on. So that's quite useful if you're decanting records out of historical books or something like that. So you don't necessarily know who recorded it, but you still want to lodge the record somewhere. And going back to the sort of my garden element, don't put just me, so that's not really useful. <laughs> so just think about who's going to look at your records in the future and make them as understandable to everybody as you can really. Okay, and this is probably quite a, a important question is, everyone says, oh well, recording's good, but why is it good? What, why are we actually recording? Well, there's quite a number of reasons why people record, and not everybody records for the same reason, but all are equally valid, of course. So personal interest uh, it's nice to go out and look at wildlife isn't it and it's great to make a list of what you've seen and i find it fascinating going back over my old lists and seeing what i've recorded in the past and when and it's quite eye-opening and particularly when you go back to the same site and it's a similar time of year in say five or ten years time and seeing how things have changed and seeing whether you're getting a better recorder as well that's quite interesting uh, there's also conservation reasons so your records collected individually are, are useful but when they're amalgamated with other people's records we start to see a far bigger picture so in this screen grab down here that this is an output that we do for North Wales Wildlife Trust so they ask us for all the biological data in their reserve boundary so that they know what's in on their reserves and how they can inform management towards protecting some of the more interesting species on site and without sharing your records the wildlife trust might not necessarily know what's on some of these reserves so great great idea to do for that reason and that these these records can also feed into larger scale uk-wide uh, projects like the state of nature report where they're actually based and they're underpinned by species records collected by the likes of you or I so it's not just recording for the sake of recording it's we are producing useful data at the end of the day and species atlases of course tracking the changes of distribution of species and that's only useful if you've got a continuous continuous range of data coming in over the years and of course informing planning decisions so if we don't know where interesting species are, we can't inform planning applications to avoid causing damage to some of our special species and what have you. So yeah, variety of reasons why people record and not everybody will record for the same reasons, but you can see there's quite a lot of nice outcomes there. Right, another question a lot of people ask is, what should I record? I'm, I'm new to recording, what should I record? Well, you could actually go outside and record forever because you open your eyes and there's always something to record. But realistically, it's, it's not feasible, is it? You've got to pick and choose what you record, really. So in theory, you can record everything, but yeah, it's not, not realistic. So I've, I've hinted at some of these points that it's nice to record even common species because they may not necessarily be common in the future. So things like red squirrel. hundred years ago, red squirrels were everywhere in Britain. And then something changed. We all know what the grey squirrel brought in diseases and what have you. But at the time, the Victorians probably never, never even thought that red squirrels would be a prompt conservation issue. But now they are. So getting those common species recorded now great because we never know what's around the corner really rarities are interesting of course everybody likes to find something unusual and uncommon and why not let, 
let's make a note of that record and long-term trends as well so as populations change and species become more common with possible global warming and climate change or equally some species become less common so unless we've got those records we we've got no evidence have we and okay so we don't want every record really so you could go to the extreme and record a dandelion on your lawn every hour of every day of the year but realistically that's not useful is it so just just think just think well if i've got a dandelion maybe one record a year is probably good enough uh, likewise if it's something like a bullfinch coming in your garden periodically maybe it's worth putting those on every day you see them so just be a bit selective but use your common sense obviously right more information so you you've done your record how do you know is it an interesting record well you can actually go on this site called the Derin, and this is a compilation site which draws records from all four biological record centers in wales so it also includes covenant data of course and you can go on there it's free to use you don't have to log in or register and you can get some really interesting quick all wales data to see your record in context so i ought to say that we're we're recording this well i think we are recording this ashley uh, and we'll be able to see this later so you can go on that Adair insight whenever and check your data now when you go into a Derin, you'll be confronted with this page and essentially the, there's two really useful areas for the for a recorder so you can either have a, a general overview of what's in your area so that will allow you to see all the records uh, within a uh, 1km square or all the species that have been recorded in there so you get a nice species list it does exclude sensitive species so things like badgers and barn owls we don't want to be putting that sort of information out freely on the internet for obvious reasons and then there's distribution maps where you can look at either a species group say uh, blue tits or all thrushes or, or what have you like that so i'll just take you through a few screen grabs from both of these facilities so what's in my area what will you get well you can, you'll be able to select off a map and you can either type in the ordnance survey 1km grid square or select it off a, a what they call a slippy map apparently one of those maps that you just click on and highlight what you want so there we've got rspb conway or one of the squares and it's generated this significant list of species so it's <laughs> You can see there that's a very well recorded 1k square so we've got over 6,000 records there 142 different species and it, it summarizes what they've got so it, it says how many records of each and when the first and last record was so that's quite nice if you've recorded something you can see oh well it's the first record for that square or oh, it hasn't been recorded there for a while and then don't know why the Covenant phone's ringing so uh, you can do it by a group so you can either select at a family level or a similar taxonomic order so you might go I don't know what uh, any family for instance so yeah just select off that drop down menu and type in what you're doing it'll it'll ask you various levels of which to go for similarly with the species so you'd go insects butterflies and then select peacock butterfly in that sort of order so you have got to know, have a fair idea of some of the taxonomic hierarchies to use that but it's usually fairly straightforward and there you go you can have a, a nice 10k square map showing you roughly where all the spe species records are and you that's quite nice because it can identify under recorded areas so you could then 
zoom in and go, oh, look, that 10K square hasn't got any butterfly records on or moth records. And then you can go and visit that square and do some recording. Okay. There's other internet resources you can use. So what I would say is that not, not one of these internet resources is completely comprehensive. So it's worth visiting a few because they're drawing data from different areas. So I think a daring is, is probably the best one for Wales, but you can always also visit MBN Atlas Wales as well. And that's a similar platform that will allow you to interrogate species records at an all Wales level. And that's the sort of out, output you'll get there. So yeah, go and have a play really. I, there's no point in me showing you all the ins and outs of this. this these are systems that you've got to uh, interact with yourself for your own interest really. Uh, it's also worth remembering that different recording schemes have got their own website platforms. So if you go onto the Biological Records Centre, the sort of national one, it'll list all the uh, different recording species groups. And many of these have got their own atlasing projects on their own websites. So well worth going down that list. It's a list of, I don't know, 50 to 100 different organisations there. So you can see there's instantly three areas that you can go and look at there and find extra information about a record that you, you've made. So please do go and look at those resources. Right, I think that's my presentation finished. So does anybody have any sort of questions about that really? I can't see anything that's popped up in the chat, but there's so few of us on the call that maybe if you do want to unmic yourself and just pose a question, you can do that. No, no, it's all fairly straightforward stuff, really. So what I'm now going to do is pass you over to my colleague, Ashling. So Ashling May, she's, I think, our Covenod data, data manager. That's right. I always get confused with the different names, what we call. So, yeah. So Ashling's going to give us about 20 minutes of specific talks of using Covenod systems. So... I'll hand over to Ashton and she can share her presentation. Okay. <clears throat> You're muting yourself, Richard, now. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, yes, I'm Ashling May, as Richard says. Um, I'm the data manager with Cobnod. Um, I'm just going to share my screen with you um, and go to my presentation. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yes, uh, Covnod uh, holds a database of over 4 million records, which is increasing all the time. Um, and just to give you an idea, um, of the different proportions uh, of different species groups within the database. Uh, it's interesting to know that nearly 40% of the data holdings are bird records, and that equates to over 1 million records. Um, so it's obviously a huge, huge number of records here, just to give you some idea of the importance of this species group. It's also one of the groups that probably attracts most new recorders, often starting out with bird watching within your own garden especially the case during this whole recent period of lockdown. Um, so it is fitting that the first of these how to record courses that we've organised is focused on birds. As an introduction, I just wanted to give you an idea of where most of the bird records that Covnod holds have come from. Of our entire data holdings going back many years, um, because of course we hold quite a lot of historic records, Bird track stands out as the single largest source of bird data. Uh, it's an online recording system developed and managed by the British Trust for Ornithology, or the BTO, and we are able to access copies of the North Wales data on a regular basis. We'll talk more about bird track later on, um, and I know Ian will, will mention it as well. 
<clears throat> we also have a large number of records from the 2008 to 2012 Breeding Bird Atlas of North Wales, which was a great project that um, ran for five years and involved a huge number of volunteer recorders and a huge amount of collation of the data at the end of that period, which I know Ian will remember well. Many records have come directly from county recorders, uh, either in the form of electronic spreadsheets, database exports, or in fact paper data in the past, especially for Northwest Wales, as we did spend quite some time extracting quite a lot of this paper data with volunteer help in the past. But more and more, the data is thankfully coming to us in electronic format. Today we're very pleased, as Richard has said to have Ian providing his expertise as the county recorder for the two northeast Wales Vice Counties. So just a word about Vice Counties. Um, uh, they're a recording unit based on historic county boundaries, but they're still widely used in biological recording today. It kind of also fits with the old county boundary of um, Clwyd, and in fact in northeast Wales we have the Clwyd Bird Recording Group, and in northwest Wales we have the Cambrian Ornithological Society, or CARS. Um, there are three Northwest Vice Counties and three additional county recorders that you won't meet today, and they are Stephen Cully, Rian Pritchard and Jim Dusto. And the website Bird Recording North Wales provides background information about both Clued Bird Recording Group and CARS, and I'm sure Ian will refer to this later on. We also have RSVB data, um, including big garden bird watch data. Um, lost my place here. Thanks. More and more BTO data is becoming available from all the various surveys that they run. Um, you may indeed wish to get involved in some of these surveys as you become more experienced and more interested in particular bird species groups. So national specialist organisations are often the focus of record gathering, quite rightly so, but the data is very much shared with local environmental record centres such as ourselves. On a more local basis, uh, there are also a considerable number of records entered through the Covnod ORS or the online recording system, over 17,000 bird records at the moment. Um, so I would like to give you a quick demonstration as to how to use the Covenant ORS because it is a very useful starting point, especially for those of you who may record many different species groups. Um, some of you I know are already ORS users, uh, but hopefully there will be a few tools and tips that you're not aware of. And there are also a couple of projects specifically looking at two bird species, swifts and curlews, which are available to you. You may also have come across the um, Lurk Wales app, um, which has its advantages. Uh, it's a, an app that can be used on a smartphone in the field, but there is a delay in availability of the records to Covenant and to the county recorder. There's a link to the app from the Covenant website if you're interested in learning more. Um, but on, uh, there's also a national database called iRecord, uh, but from the Covnod and the County Recorder's perspective, the two options that really are best for submitting bird records are the Covnod ORS and Bird Track, which is preferred by all or most County Recorders. So I think if you're really getting into bird recording, that's where you should go. But as a general um, recorder and just getting used to recording different groups, the Covnod ORS is also really useful to know how to use that. Um, okay, um, so. Uh, the, yeah, one of the main advantages of the OS as well is that if you're entering records for different species groups, um, they're available immediately to the relevant county recorder and we have very dedicated local experts for all the main species groups. As well as birds, these include county recorders for mammals, plants, butterflies, moths, dragonflies, spiders and fish. Um, and it's worth saying that all of these county recorders are acting in a voluntary capacity. Oh, one other final option is that if you do have data in a spreadsheet format, and you can always email it to us and we can import it. There's certainly no need to re-enter any records onto 
the ORS or buried track. Okay, just to move on then to the ORS. And the rest of my talk really will just be running through some of the tools and methods of entering records using the ORS. And any questions, please put them in the chat or um, we'll open up the floor at the end of this section for any specific questions. <clears throat> So um, the ORS, um, the Covenant Online Recording System, is actually 14 years old. It was one of the very first recording systems, online recording systems that was developed. Uh, but there's a new version pending, hopefully by the end of this year, which will be able to be used from a smartphone in the field, which will be quite useful. It's been designed and developed in-house and as well as being able to put your ad hoc records on, there are some specific projects, including a number of public projects. And also some people have access to um, restricted projects, such as monitoring different species groups, dormice, um, uh, reptiles, etc. And then there's sometimes some groups using it as well, and this enables them to share records with each other. So um, there's all kinds of um, aspects to the ORS. Uh, so to access it, you first go to the Covenant website, and I know many of you are already ORS users, so you'll be familiar with logging in at the top of the screen or on the left, but if you haven't used it before, there's a very quick registration process. Uh, you just put in some basic details, set a password, and you're good to go. You then will see a members tab appear on the far right of the toolbar and um, you'll go straight into the welcome page in the Covenant members area. There's some user specific content at the top, which it, where it will say when you last logged in and how many records you've entered, etc. And then down the bottom, there are some more generic tools. So a direct link to the species dictionary, a direct link to the interactive mapping facility. Um, and also useful to know that there's an icon there for my details where you can update your um, email address, your postal address, and very usefully you can also put in some information about your recording interests and also your experience level so that if a counter recorder is looking at one of your records in the future and um, maybe deciding whether or not, um, you know, whether maybe they're not quite sure whether it's um, reliable or not, but if they have an idea about your level of skill with that particular species group, it could be quite useful to them. Um, back to the members page, you'll see we have uh, the icon to enter records, which is what they'll be using most of the time. If I click on that, whoops, let's go back one. Um, we have the options that come up for most of you. Um, starting with standard entry at the top, and then some of these public projects. These do vary a bit over time, but currently we have a couple that are particularly relevant to bird recording, which is the Swift Recovery, which is a North Wales Wildlife Trust project to try and help swift populations, and also the Curlew Cymru project. And the difference with um, clicking on either of these options is that you'll get a little bit of information about the project, and there may be some additional fields that you need to fill in because they're looking for very specific information for these projects. But clicking standard entry, you bring up the standard data entry form. And um, the first element you then will need to look at is choosing your species name. So this is the hot element of the record that Richard referred to. So firstly, you choose the species group, so in this case, birds from the drop down list. And this uh, really just speeds up the process of finding the species you're interested in. Uh, you then um, type in a bit of the name of the species that you're um, trying to enter a record for. And um, you can use English or scientific names if you're using the English side of the website, but you can also use the ORS in Welsh by clicking on Cymraeg. And if you're using this in Welsh, you will be accessing the Welsh names from Cymdeithas Edward Clwyd, as well as the scientific names, again, from the UK Species Inventory. So this is a very standard dictionary that is used throughout the UK. Sometimes names may be out of date, but that's because the Natural History Museum 
has to constantly update um, names based on advice from different specialist groups. So do contact us if there's anything you're finding difficulty with entering. The next section then to look at is the location details. So um, we have a site name field where you type in the where, the first element of the where, and then with the grid reference you've got the choice of entering the grid reference if you know it and clicking find on map to check it or you need to refine it or you can use the map to search and find your grid reference. You can search by place name or postcode. Just to show you what the mapping functionality looks like, uh, if you're putting in a one kilometer grid reference or starting at quite a low uh, level of detail, you'll initially get an ordnance survey map up. Um, and in, many, in some cases with bird records, that will be a level of detail you wish to enter. But really, for Covenant purposes, it's best to have a six or an eight figure grid reference if you can. So you would use the magnifying glass icons on the top right of the screen to zoom in and out. And um, the more you zoom in, um, you'll, you'll access an aerial photograph, which will help you to maybe refine where you actually saw the, the, the bird. So it may be that you can put in a six figure grid reference, which covers a hundred meters square. Well, perhaps in some cases you might have seen the bird on a particular tree and you can click on you, you, you click on the map in the area, you've seen the bird, you zoom in a bit more and you'll see that the box will get, sm you know, will get smaller and the number of figures in the grid reference will get larger. So an eight figure grid reference would equate to a one meter square. And when you're happy that the square that you're seeing covers the area you saw the bird, you click on the green plus button and it will return it to the um, data entry screen. And it will automatically say, in that case, that you selected it from the interactive map. Uh, as I said, a six or eight figure grid reference is really best for Covenant purposes. Next section then is to add your abundance record type um, information and an attachment which provides extra evidence. And all of these are optional, but they are important if you can add this information. So. Uh, under abundance, you may enter a count or you may enter a count and a qualifier. And the qualifiers that you can choose from uh, range from adult, adult, female, adult, male, and juvenile options, and other options such as chick, egg, nest, etc. And you'll find that these qualifiers vary depending on what species group you're entering records for. It's worth noting, and this in fact will pop up when you're entering a bird record, that you um, need to be careful using the term adult when recording bird species, and Ian may refer to this later on, but there's an option in here for full grown, which you can use unless you are familiar with the adult plumage of a particular species, because it is quite a, quite a specific thing. Record types as well, just to show you what pops up under record types if you're entering a bird record. Um, a few different options there. Again, uh, none of these may be relevant for particular records or one of them may be relevant. So use them when you can. Um, but what is particularly critical here as well is to attach evidence if possible. Um, and in many cases, this will be a photograph but in some cases, if you're distinguishing between some species, especially with birds, so an example would be willow and marsh tit, a recording of the song or call is better, and some phones do this quite well. So where you see the attachment and browse option here, you can um, browse to find any file that you've got on your computer, which could be a, a MP3 or some other kind of audio file, or it could be a photograph, or it could be a video. In fact, we have quite a few records put in now with video footage from camera traps. So all of these attachments are available to the county recorder when they look at records to check them. Um, so evidence is really, really helpful in helping them confirm that a record is correct as far as they know. Um, so I just wanted to show you a very nice photograph here, which is attached to a waxwing record courtesy of Castle Vision Photographic, so just um, a 
as an example of some really nice photographic evidence. But even a very a fairly blurry photograph can still be, be useful. Um, it's better to have something attached than nothing, but of course, in a lot of cases, you may have missed the bird, it may have flown away too quickly. Um, now, uh, moving on to the next section on the right of the data entry form, you need to add your recorder name, the date and any notes. Um, now the recorder will generally default to the name of the person entering the record, but you might be entering a record on someone else's behalf, or you might be entering a record where you don't know who the recorder was. And in that case, as Richard said, you put a non. So you can overwrite what pops up in the recorder box there. You can also, in fact, add more than one recorder by clicking on the little icon to the right of the field there with the plus and that. So you can add two or three recorders if you're out in a group. You can also add a determiner. Uh, this perhaps less relevant for bird records, but often if you recording something like a moss, you might take a sample, send it off to somebody and they might confirm what your identification was and then you would add that information there. The date, um, you can use the little calendar icon to just choose today's date or to um, you know, go back a few days, a few weeks and click on the date from the calendar or you can also type it into the field here in this format. As Richard mentioned earlier, there will be occasions when you don't have the full date. So you click on the vague date symbol there and you can put in a month or a season or a year. But if possible, it's best to put in the actual date. It's also possible to add a date range, but I would say if you're going to do that, it's worth putting a note to say what the date range refers to. For example, did you see that bird every day between those two dates or does it just mean that it was seen at some point in that range and you're not sure when. Now, notes um, can be used for a variety of purposes, um, but if the species that you're recording is unusual or maybe new to you, it might be worth using it to describe any distinguishing features or to add anything else which is relevant to the county recorder or to data users. So in this case, I was entering this test record yesterday of Willow Tit, um, I wasn't, I was, um, I wanted to show you how you could enter a record that you're not sure about, put a very low confidence um, and to put some details in the notes to alert the country recorder that there is a audio file attached that they can listen to because you're not actually sure if it was marsh tit or without it. Um, because a low confidence means that the record will definitely be looked at by the country recorder. Um, so you filled in the whole of the form, you click submit record and then the record pops up underneath the record form for checking uh, and you can edit it at this point if you need to by clicking on the little pencil symbol to the left of the record. What that will do will um, put everything back up in the data entry form, you change what you need to change and then you click update record. The bin icons, which um, you can see one at the bottom there, would allow you to delete that record if you decided that you actually had made a complete mistake with it. Um, if you have anything filled in in any of these fields and you want to delete the information as you're entering your record, again, the bin icons are used to clear the field. Um, and then another really useful tool that you need to know about is that every field has a padlock symbol to the left of it and you can lock the information in that field. So if you were entering a list of bird species from a particular site, you might put in your site name, your grid reference, your date and your recorder name, lock all that information, uh, put in the species that you're recording first, submit the record, and then you'll find that all that information you've locked is still there in the data entry form. So you just have to enter the next species, submit record, and then the next one, the next one. So it really speeds data entry process up. Just going back then to the members area, um, as well as entering records, you may want to view your records. So here you can view any records you've previously submitted. You will see in some cases that you have quite a few options here, different batches of records that you've entered under. Everybody will have the My Standard Entry records. In this case, 
I've entered some under a swift recovery project, so I can view those records. So you tick to the left of the ones that you are interested in viewing, more than one if you wish, or click on the top left to select all, and then click view records. This will give you a tabular view. So this is the records submitted under a swift recovery, just showing you these for uh, the purposes of this training. And um, there's a few useful things to know here. So on the left of each record, you've got two symbols. The one on the left here is where you can add user comments. So um, once you've entered a record, um, it, after, um, well, say you enter a record today, after midnight tonight, you won't be able to edit the record again. So if you decided that you'd made a mistake with the record, you could come and find the record and add user comment, which will alert us that you want us to do something with our records. It might say, I've entered the wrong grid reference, please can you change it to this? So we'll get an email telling us what you've said. The other symbol then to the right of this is the quick filter button and this enables you to perhaps view all records on a particular citing date by just clicking on the citing date put in the list or if you had a mix of species records here you could view all records with the, the same species name. Now there is a more detailed filtering option which is on the right of the, of the view records page uh, and there's also a tools button and the tools button will be very useful to you for various things such as mapping your records or downloading them if you wish to do so, so that you have them in Excel or something like that. Um, you just click on the appropriate option. You can um, map or download everything you're viewing or you can filter first and then map just those records or you can tick in the boxes to the left of specific records too. You just want to download a selection or map a selection. And that's what the records will look like when you've mapped them. Um, so they give you a nice overview and you can zoom in to get, because sometimes you'll have an area where there's a big clump of records and you'll just see a number and you can zoom in and then get to see them mapped as you zoom in. The status of your record will be shown on the right of the tabular view. And um, this is telling us whether or not your record has been verified by the county recorder. Um, this, the symbols, coloured um, circles that you'll see um, relate to whether the record is being set to probably or known correct. Um, known correct will generally only be if there's a photograph attached or something like that, but, but both known and probably correct records are used in the Covenant data searches that we run. So our um, perfectly um, valid uh, verification levels. Unconfirmed means that the county recorder couldn't make a decision based on the information attached. So um, in some cases, perhaps because the record is a bit too far back in time or just there isn't enough information attached for them to be confident that the record was definitely correct. But they may get in touch with you to ask for some more information or maybe Covenant staff may as well because sometimes people maybe just haven't attached the photograph that they actually have or they can give a little bit more feedback as to why they decided it was X species rather than Y. Sometimes the records will be set to incorrect and um, don't be overly concerned about this. There will often be a comment to say if there was a photograph attached, for example, that actually it was this other species and then it is possible for us to update the records. Um, and it's all a learning process. So this is actually quite, quite useful sometimes to provide feedback to recorders. Unassessed records are those that haven't been verified but haven't needed to be verified because they're of um, quite easy to identification level really. So records are prioritised for checking by various factors, but this includes an ID difficulty rating. Uh, but then there are also automated geographic and temporal checks. They're no, by no means um, completely foolproof, but it just gives us a way of prioritising which records need to be looked at. And then the final thing that will mean that your record needs to be checked is if you put a low confidence level. So that comes to the end of my um, quick overview of the ORS. Um, 
just to say that on our website there is a link to a find a local expert section where you can um, check who is the local expert for a particular vice county and a particular species group and these are the four um, vice county recorders for birds so we have Jim Dusto covering Marianneth, Leon Pritchard covering Carnarvonshire, Ian covering Denbyshire and Flintshire and Steve Cully covering Anglesey. Um, as Richard said the, the um, courses will be recorded but really you can navigate to this from our website if you want to uh, contact any of these recorders. Um, thank you for listening. Have we any questions at this point? Yeah, we've got a couple of questions there, Ashling. I uh, don't know if you want to stop screen sharing. Okay, so uh, going back to the roles, I think it was, Ian's asked a question, what what use does Covenant make of those interests that you lodge when you register sort of recording interests like birds, insects, butterflies? And I suppose I, I can answer that. It's generally what we're trying to do is get an idea of what people's main recording interests are and that way if you've ticked to receive GDPR compliant communications from us if an event in the area happens that's related to those subjects say for instance uh, the National Recording Group for Species Group is coming to North Wales and we need to get in contact with you to let you know that that's going to happen because you might be interested in attending. That's one way we can rapidly get your email addresses and make you aware of anything that's potentially interesting to you that happens in North Wales. It's uh, also the case, Richard, that the county recorder can click on that, mm. um, on the name of the recorder that's entered a particular record and they can see that information as well. So that's yeah. kind of what I was thinking of it more being used for that. Um, yeah, that people can see that, that somebody's maybe been on a particular course or they've, um, they have quite a lot of years of experience of recording this particular species group because maybe they're new to the area or something. And so the county recorder isn't familiar with them. Okay, and then more interesting question, I suppose is, uh, David's asked why, essentially, why why is there so many different recording platforms for different species groups, and why isn't there one centralised national recording uh, platform for everything, really? And I suppose that's the, how it's evolved, really. Uh, I think we were quite <clears throat> we we could well have been one of the first. I think mm -hmm. asking we having were, a, yeah. an online recording system, and you could say we were the first to start it and others have copied well that would be mean to say but obviously a national recording scheme wants to control their own data <clears throat> for publication and remember a lot of these different platforms will share data across them so for instance bird track if you submit records to bird track covnod will receive that data so there's no need to, to duplicate your records by putting them on bird track and mm. covnod just put them on bird track and then they'll come to us anyway mm. uh, likewise they can get mm. at a, a lower resolution so don't feel compelled to submit your records to multiple places and it depends what you're recording of course some species groups prefer you to use one platform over another so do do ask the people that are the vice county recorders what, what what's your preferred method to receive data in and it it may be that they they just want to take it as an excel spreadsheet submitted directly to them so i can't speak for everybody but that's probably the reason is why there's such a proliferation is that everybody has a different flavor to how they want things to be recorded and some of the recording platforms ask different questions they're, they're more specific so uh Ours is a recording system where you can record everything. Some, for instance, may just record one species <clears throat> have specific yeah. ecology information that they're after. So, portals yeah. for courses, really. I think it's yeah. worth also saying that the Covnod ORS is a local system where there's quite a lot of local feedback to recorders, whereas iRecord, which is a national system, 
there is very little, I think, a direct feedback to recorders because it's not really possible. So that although there are local recorders acting as verifiers, but it's such a big system that there is just isn't the capacity to have direct um, contact with everyone and there isn't the capacity to maybe have direct training of, of, of local people or, or you know assisting people to get used to using the system because it's it's you know you're a bit more removed from it because it's it's a whole UK based system um, so I think yeah these different systems have evolved because of slightly different circumstances but as Richard said um, the data is shared between us so you should have to just put your record in one place Okay, uh, another question has come in, so let me just read it. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can You can certainly go back and enter new recording interests uh, if you edit your profile. So log in, go in there, add it. So I see you've mentioned you've got an interest in ostracods. Yeah, please mention that because we're always interested to hear about people with very unusual recording interests because I guess you, you may well be the only Ostracod recorder in North Wales for all we're aware of and it's great to know that you're out there so yeah you could you could be the next vice county recorder for Ostracods with that sort of level of interest and knowledge because I'm sure we've got records of Ostracods we, we gather data from lots of places so there'll be records from NRW, uh, Old Environment Agency, pre-NRW, so we do have records of them. So get in touch if you want to help. Uh, okay. So, yeah. Okay, so yeah, you, Gary, you just mentioned that uh, your interest was a long time ago but yeah if you want to restart recording ostracods we're, we're very interested in pursuing that and yeah all, all the ostracod species lists will be in that species dis dictionary you'll be able to go on there and submit your records and it's good that it's all held in one place it's, it gets away from that danger of managing it on an excel spreadsheet and mistyping the name it's very easy to do when you're managing it manually like that whereas a, a database system allows you to iron out those mistakes and it's a lot, lot easier to manage really okay I, th I think we'll probably draw this one to a conclusion and uh, if you th think of any other questions we can pose them towards the end as well so we're going to hand over to ian now who's going to give you a much more detailed flavor of bird recording and exactly what he's looking for and some good advice about how to start recording birds as well of course so i'll hand you over to ian who will do a screen share of his presentation Can you hear me? Sorry. Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Richard? Hello, Richard. Can you? I mean, yeah, I, I was just on mute. Sorry. Ah, right. Yes, okay. we, we can hear you now. I'll put myself back on mute. OK. Gosh, you're a harsh int introduction. I'm hoping that what I got to say will be a bit more interesting than my question. But who knows? We shall find out. Anyway, um, I'm assuming then that, uh, well, I'm assuming nothing. So I'm just starting from, uh, from ground zero, if you like. So if you're going to be recording birds, kind of what things do you need to help you to do it? Well, it starts off fairly basic. You need your eyes, you need your ears. And I'm sure people who are blind would be very good at the hearing side of things and people who are deaf well they've only they can only look but although I haven't got time to go into it today the thing about ears is uh, if you're wanting to get to know species actually listening for bird song and calls is really important 
and it's best to start that off in the winter when only residents, only mainly our resident species are here, perhaps some wintering ones with calling. But if you want to learn bird song, early spring, before the leaves are out, our resident birds will be singing away, learn them, and then you can expand with the summer visitors as they come along. Okay, so the, 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 I suppose the first basic piece of kit that any bird watcher is really going to want is a pair of binoculars. And I guess the, the, the thing I'd say there is go and test them and buy the ones that are the best you can afford. Um, and there's a huge range in binoculars, but don't go for necessarily a cheap pair because if you're looking through them a lot, I'm not sure that you're going to be doing your eyes an awful lot of favours if, if they're not optically good. Um, one of the uh, Ian, I, yeah. can I just, just butt in? I don't think we're actually seeing your presentation. We've just got a white screen up. I don't know. Uh, it says share, screen sharing. Have you shared the right, right screen? I'll stop the share and start it again then. Yeah. I chose my PowerPoint. Okay. Is that a picture of binoculars? It is, yeah. Okay, it must have just been a temporary glitch. Okay, okay. carry on. Yeah, so as I was saying, uh, but by the, you know, the, the best binoculars you can afford. And one of the things that is, uh, is unfortunate, I've found in my life, is that when I was young and really keen and wanted to do it, of course I couldn't afford a decent pair of bins like these ones. Although this particular pair, my wife won in a raffle, but that's another matter. And then as your interest grows, you might actually want to have a telescope so that you can see birds further away or in greater detail. And if you've got a scope, having a case to protect it from bashes is helpful. You need a tripod. And if you have one of these fancy packs um, that you can fit to the tripod so that you can actually carry the tripod on your back when you're walking. So if you go to a point of air and you park your car and you want to walk out to the RSPB hide, you can put your tripod on your back until you get out to the hide. That's very useful. As for identifying birds, I guess this is probably the best field guide we've got in Britain at the moment. It's uh, regularly available. I mean, Collins, all book, good bookshops should have that. And this is the kind of information inside. So you've got all sorts of illustrations and information to read if you get around to doing that. I really do, I must admit, it's, I'm mainly looking at the pictures. This guide has also now been made into, into an app. So here, shown on an iPad. And this is incredibly useful if because uh, you can take it out into the field with you and you can choose whichever group you want to go to. And then because it's an app, there might be some video, but more importantly, there might be a recording of song. And uh, three years ago, my wife and I went to Spain to do some um, atlas work for the uh, European Breeding Bird Atlas 2 that's going to be published later this year. And with species that we're not over familiar with, that are common down in Spain, we were able to check out was what we were hearing the species we thought we were looking at. And of course, that is incredibly useful. Back at home, you can still develop your skills and the BTO website has this very good range of uh, bird identification videos. So you go to home, develop your skills, bird identification, you come to this page and then you click a bit further to identification videos. And then you can choose which ones you want. And there's a whole list of them. Uh, I, I can't show you them just now, but uh, there are lots of videos, there's very helpful commentary telling you the kinds of things to look out for. So that's a very useful resource. Now, coming to the uh, what, you know, recording of what to record, one of the things I find very useful uh, is to have this uh, app on my phone, um, the OS Locate app, because it tells you also where you're traveling, and also it gives a grid reference. Now this one is only a six figure grid reference, which is okay for some things. There is another app that uh, provides a 10 figure uh, 
reference, but uh, I choose not to use it for reasons I won't go into now. Or alternatively, you can get a, a small, fairly cheap GPS system yourself. Uh, by cheap, I mean, I think on eBay, somebody I know got one of these for about 30 quid, which is not too bad. And here in the middle, if you choose the OS grid reference as the system, there, that's telling you that this was taken in SJ2466, which is where I live in Suchton. And with a bit more detail, that might, well, that probably go, bears down to our front room, but there we go. So that's useful. So if you're out and about, what should you record? Well, some of this was covered already. Certainly the date, and I would say to a day for recording birds, the place, and definitely with a grid reference, because as a recorder, if you say some village name, I don't know whether you are in the village, outside the village, or whatever, but a 1km reference is enough. That's 2466, that's the blue square that you see on an Ordnance Survey map. And seeing as birds fly around, that for my purposes is perfectly adequate, but at least I've got an idea where you were. Now, one thing that uh, Ashling didn't mention earlier, but this is a bird track thing. If you're out, record the start time of when you were doing things. I'll come back to why in a minute. Then you're going to record species and you may count them. On the other hand, you may not, and that's not necessarily a problem, but you're on in whatever it is you're using, be it the bird track app or a notebook, because uh, I still use a notebook because I, I find that handier. Um, you, you'll make a list and then at the end of the session, record the time again. Now, when you enter the records and if you enter them into BirdTrack, and BirdTrack is a system that's freely available, it doesn't cost you anything, you just have to register with the BTO to be able to use it. And I'm going to explain later why I think there are advantages for uh, using bird track but if you put the start time and the end time and you record all the species that you hear or see that's incredibly useful for the BTO point of view because they've been doing some work on finding out whether the kinds of records gathered by observers just going out generally and making these what they call complete lists can be used to supplement things like structured atlas observations that have been used as was referred to earlier for the North Wales atlas. Um, so the complete list are things that are, in, are very useful for the BTO because they know how long you were there and if you've recorded everything that you were able to identify by sight or sound then they know that anything that isn't in your list probably wasn't there or at least you weren't able to identify it. So here's my scruffy notebook. And so, right, okay, this is at a place called Garve Alien. I think if I remember correctly, that's um, on the road out to uh, Ardnamurchen uh, up in Scotland. And so it started at 15.15 in the afternoon. We had four bullfinches, there was a robin, there was a heron, uh, a hoodie crow, then we saw a couple of otters, six grey seal, then there were long-tailed tit, blue tit, coal tit, oyster catcher and herring gull. By the way, these codes are not mine. The BTO has a standard list of two-letter codes that are really useful if you, if, you, if you develop your skills and you want to do any kind of uh, survey work. Why? Because they're so easy and simple and quick to write down. I mean, writing long-tailed tit by you know longhand is takes ages lt is nice and quick and so uh, then we finished that at 1550 so that was just what 25 minutes stop uh, or 35 minutes stop sorry and then here's another date another place this was when we were coming back from scotland we went for a walk around strathclyde loch and i because it's the way i am we started off in this 1k square we got a list we went into another 1k square, so I started another list and it, and it went on like that. Oh, sorry, the ticks there will show that I've put them into bird track. Two other useful resources are 
these regular bird watching magazines. One is called Bird Watching and the other is called Bird Watch. Uh, bird Watch, I suppose, tends to be very heavily in, into uh, rare species. And I must admit, I find the whole rarity thing a bit boring myself. Uh, it's never really grabbed me. I'm much more interested in what's happening with um, common species um, because some of them in my lifetime have gone, you know, right really down the pan. But that's another thing I'm going to come back to. Now, if you keep all these records and they go in either to Covnard ORS or you put them into bird track, what are they, what's actually going to happen to them? Ah, now there's something else I've remembered from something um, Ashling talked about earlier, sources of bird records. In North Wales, I think we have at least two blogs which encourage you to put your records. And the sad thing is that the blogs do not then forward their records to either Covnod or BirdTrack. They just sit on the blog site. And I, I have a life and I just haven't got the time to go into blogs to pull out the records. So I would advise you, please avoid putting records into them. It, it, I, it may seem as if you're doing something useful, but actually I don't think any use can be made of the records that go into them. But for the records that do go into places where they can be used, like the ORS, like Bird Track, uh, this is the last report I produced, which was last year, obviously with the help of others. I didn't do it entirely on my own. And this is what you'd see inside it. And this bird report is unusual compared with some because what I do is I use all the records I receive get used. So for example, black-headed gull, each little square there shows where black-headed gulls were recorded during 2018 within the vice counties of Denbyshire and Flintshire. I don't know of any other bird report in the country yet that does that on a regular basis for every species. And I think it's crazy because where you see birds is geographical. Why not present it as a map which is geographical? Because I hate reading about three were seen in this village, two were seen in this other village and so on. But that, sorry, that was a personal bit of bias that slipped out. But the other thing that you won't find in many reports is this kind of table here. Uh, at the front of the report, I explain how this occurrence is worked out. And we say, well, if black and yellow, well, here it's called abundant and abundant in Denbyshire and Flintshire. I say the number of 1k squares it was recorded in, then the maximum count in each of the counties, the average maximum count over the last 10 years, uh, for which I thank Tim May of Covnod for helping me with the coding for access to deal with that. Uh, then if it was recorded in the breeding bird survey squares, okay, it wasn't recorded in any in Denbyshire, but in four out of 21 in Flintshire. How many records did I receive of this species? Well, 567 in Denbyshire, 860 in Flintshire. What percentage of bird track lists did this uh, species occur on? That's the complete list I was telling you about earlier. So as you can see, it's slightly lower in Denbyshire than it is in Flintshire. And I calculate this thing called density. There's an explanation of it in the introduction to the report. But essentially it's saying that um, you're more likely to see black-headed gulls in Flintshire than you are in Denbyshire. Especially if you're traveling around in this hinterland here of kind of uh, pastoral farmland, which doesn't, isn't a favourite for bird watchers you, and for some reason you know you won't you're less likely to see the black headed gulls but uh, as you can see they're certainly down the river Cluid Valley there at the start near the estuary and then last of all in terms of breeding there are atlas codes oh ah oh I go back okay. previous yep uh, there are atlas codes that are used. So FL means fledged young were seen and ON means that something was seen on a nest. So those are confirmed breeding codes. Uh, whereas for Kittywake, of course, we've got no breeding codes at all because they don't breed in northeast Wales. 
similarly with green shank there are no breeding codes there either so anyway that's a bird report and if you can help provide records for a that means there's then a record for if somebody wants to see how a species was doing in a particular year and a part of the country, the bird report tells you. So, Ashling, I think it was Ashling rather than Richard mentioned the Bird Recording North Wales website, uh, brnw.com. And this is it, and so it's got all sorts of information available. And if you want to find out about recording birds, there's information there and so on. Okay, if you see a, a, a species that you're not sure what it is, even though you've been looking at the field guide and whatever, what do you need to do? Well, certainly these days, a photograph is ideal. And with lots of people having smartphones, possibly with their bins, because some people manage to do that, or with a scope, try and get a picture of the bird, because sometimes even a blurry picture can be useful. Alternatively, write or dictate into your phone a description of the bird, saying what the different feather tracks look like in terms of colour, and of course giving an idea of size. I seem to remember that um, uh, somebody sent in a, a description of a bird that it had a red bill and it was black and white. And the bird recorder at the time immediately thought, oh, that must be an oyster catcher. What the person didn't say was that the bird stood about a metre tall and it was actually a white stalk, which is rather different, of course. Anyway, this is just something I grabbed off the web and it was actually an Indian thing, so which is why this bird looks a bit unusual to us. But having one of these sorts of diagrams with you can be helpful. Tuck it in the back of your notebook. So because what we want to know is, um, you know, the greater coverts, the primaries, the tail, the undertail coverts, the upper tail coverts and the rump, all these different bits of the bird, what sorts of colours were they? And if you can describe that, that can be really helpful in working out whether you saw what you claim you saw. And ideally, we would like to think that your description confirms it. Okay, so what should I do with my bird records? Well, I've hinted a lot on that already. So this is, uh, this is the front page of bird track. And I really would encourage you to use bird track because if you put your records into bird track, they're, they're available for you to examine in all the sorts of ways that uh, the ORS shows. And I think a few more. If you tick the right box, then your records in bird track are available to the county recorder for the bird reports. Your records will go, will go from the recorder to Covnod, or perhaps increasingly in the future, directly from the BTO to Covnod. So Covnod doesn't miss out. And it allows, if the records are in bird track, the BTO can use your records for research that they do. And that is incredibly useful. And so to, to finish here, further options, what, what, what would you like to do with your bird watching? Well, there's that RSPB one hour garden bird watch thing every year, forget that. BTO does garden bird watch where you can record the birds in your garden every day of every week of every, of every year. And that really is useful and they do all sorts of things. And the Garden Bird Watch website, so if you see sick birds, you know, like uh, greenfinch with trichomonosis, uh, you can record that. If you see great tits with avian pox and these great big swellings on their head, you can record that. And if a bird flies into your window and dies, you can record that as well. So the Garden, yeah, garden Bird Watch is certainly well worth doing. I, I've been doing it since the start of the project, which was many years ago. Once you get into birding and you're, you're quite happy with recording and, and hopefully your knowledge of bird song is, in, is improving. Um, yeah, because I only started really learning bird song late on. And by late on, I mean, probably I was around 40 or so. My wife, whose picture was at the start of this, she's been learning bird song since she was a kid. So she's much better than I am. But 
you can get to learn birdsong and then the breeding bird survey is an incredibly useful thing to do because that's where the BTO is able to gauge whether our breeding species populations are going up or down and that information contributes to that government health of the nation index that they use. Then if you, if you do to get a telescope there's wetland bird survey and that can be where you go to um, an estuary and you're trying to count birds that are out way out in the mud you know Clavans, uh, Trith Clavan, Clavan Sands well Creon Pritchard the county recorder for Carmarthen I mean, he does wetland bird survey there and uh, you know trying to count birds at a mile you know kilometers out on the mud is quite a challenge but nonetheless interesting. There's heronry census, but we don't have much of that in North East Wales simply because we haven't got many heronries. Uh, but it's actually the longest running scheme of the BTO, started in 1928. I didn't mention Atlas because um, here, because the Atlas is a periodic thing and um, the National Atlas is about every 20 years. So we're not expecting the next one to start until at least 2027. I'm hoping I'll still be up and available to do uh, do field work for that because I love Atlas field work, it's brilliant. And so I'd recommend you check out the BTO website for all sorts of other possibilities. And I think that's it.